Hello, Internet! Welcome to STEMA, my creature collector where the creatures are based off of science topics. Alright, alright. But before I show you another creature design, I wanted to ask, how do creature collectors collect creatures? See, gameplay-wise, who cares? Most people just care what the creatures look like and what they do. But the in-world methods can have heavy implications on the rest of the game's lore and branding. I have a rough idea of what I want to do, which I'll go over before showing off a related creature. But first, we should look at what other games in the genre have been doing. So let's start from the beginning. When you google what is the first monster catcher, you get the Megami Tensei series, starting back from Ho! 1987? Now this series is still going on to this day, but here, you don't cast any balls to catch monsters. In fact, you don't really catch the monster, which is why this genre is also called monster taming games. In Megami Tensei, there are devils, and you can actually talk to them to see if they join you or not, which is determined by your alignment. Now this harkens to what monster catchers actually are, they're role-playing games, or RPGs. Games where you take the role of a protagonist and play through their story. As you progress through the chapters, however, it's common to have a party of characters that follow along. These new characters can showcase different personalities, offer entertainment through banter, but they can also provide different styles of gameplay. A party member could be a reckless bruiser, or they might be more of a healer than a fighter. In turn-based RPGs, there's an emphasis on strategically managing your team during combat. And while many RPGs have a predetermined character that you would meet at a certain point in the story, providing a certain style of gameplay, Megami Tensei's Monster Catcher formula offered some autonomy where you get to choose who's with you to change up your gameplay. And to reiterate, the method to have these demons join you in this game was to talk to them as if you're making an emotional connection. It's really less about catching monsters, but more befriending them. Later on, another game called Dragon Quest V would have something similar where the monsters would ask you whether they could join you on your quest. But the process was simplified. Simply just beat the monster in battle and they randomly might or might not ask you afterwards as they're in awe with your strength. So for now, just remember how the creatures wanted to join you, and there wasn't really a need of any doohickey to necessarily catch them. Chronologically, I should be talking about Pokemon now, but I think it'll make more sense to first talk about Digimon, digital monsters. Now while people might recognize them as a monster catching game, Digimon was made to be a masculine counterpart to Tamagotchi, which is a physical toy with a little screen where you could feed and raise a little creature in there. But by the time Digimon grew into making mangas, animes, other video games, their world kind of established that the monsters are more or less your friend, as they could talk with you. Now, if you look at the rest of the monster taming genre so far, this isn't that big of a departure to how you could talk to the devils in Megami Tensei. However, there is a doohickey this time in kind of recruiting the mon, because in Digimon it works a little differently. You have some gadget where you can scan a new Digimon from an encounter, and with enough scans of the same Digimon, you can make an egg of them and basically become their parent slash best friend. There's apparently isn't one single scanning device as the game's changed over time. And from what I've seen, this franchise went through a lot of changes in their games. But now let's talk about a franchise that got so popular to the point where people would have a different idea about this whole genre, where friendly talking monsters would become more of an oddity than the norm. Pokemon has balls. Okay, there's actually a lot more to talk about. So in Pokemon or Pocket Monsters, the monsters act more like the wildlife, who you can catch and use to battle for you. The capture system was inspired by Gasha Pond toys, which were little capsules that you could get from a gumball machine-like contraption. So there's a lid and a base, simplifies into two halves of spear and a button to open them. It's simple and iconic. And with the franchise's booming success, people would recognize this shape anywhere, even in unrelated places. But this iconic branding doesn't just help Pokemon's recognition in our world, but it also helped Pokemon set up their own world. Pokeball logos signified important areas like health centers. Random items are found in Pokeballs in the wild. And because of that, some creatures were designed to be Pokeball mimics to surprise the player. 
Now these Pokeballs work by throwing them at a Mon where they shrink into a ball, and there's a random chance of them staying in there. But what's the strategy to increase the catch rate? Well, you could use a certain ball or a certain- Beat them up. Beat them into submission. There's a bit of a minigame here because you want to weaken them, but you don't want to outright KO them. And this is what is universally the most well known. But hold up, did you just see what just happened? You're no longer really having an emotional connection to have these guys join you. Instead of talking to these creatures, you're throwing a ball at them. You're now catching monsters, you monster. Unintentionally, the notion that these creatures are your friends has been stripped, and Pokemon's dominance of the genre have people, including me, calling these games monster catchers instead of monster tamers. As Pokemon was the game that blew up internationally, other people have accentuated this dark nature of forcing creatures on your team other than befriending them. Now I suspect this is an unintentional side effect from Pokemon because ironically of all the games talked about so far, Pokemon is not supposed to be the darkest one by far. Satoshi Tajiri, creator of Pokemon, outright was against violent implications, making a firm distinction between fainting and outright death and also wanting kids to connect with each other through trading instead of just battling. And over the years, Pokemon has tried to implement more of that emotional connection through specific wordings and even gameplay mechanics to make sure that, yeah, these mods actually want to be with you. People might see all this and think it's Pokemon just aiming for babies and coddling their audience, but in a way, they're just finally implementing the emotions that this genre was built off of befriending your opponents. Heck, I didn't even know about all this when I was deciding my own mechanic. But now I think it's worthwhile to briefly go over three titles that were later inspired by Pokemon and see how they execute their creature collecting mechanic. Temtem by far had the most publicity around their launch. So how did they catch their monsters? You throw a special card and hope it will successfully trap the Temtem. Also weakening said Temtem improves the catch rate. But how about Coromon by Tracksoft? Well, they use a spinner to also capture Mons, where weakening them makes it easier to catch. Alright, I should note that both of these games have plenty of differences in their mechanics, but like what I said at the beginning of this video, who really cares about the catching mechanism? It doesn't affect the gameplay by much, and Pokemon's method of trying to beat your enemy but not fully KOing them offers a challenge that's more entertaining than complete luck or being fully dependent on a certain requirement. Rest assured, Temtem and Coromon have changes elsewhere, like in how resources are managed, how types are synergized, so on and so forth. So lastly, Cassette Beast does not capture their beasts, but you rather use your cassette to record them. Now that's clever. There's still that strategy where weakening them makes it easier to catch, but recording can take multiple turns, leaving the combat completely up to your partner. Also in Cassette Beast, you actually become the beast. So I guess it's not really a monster catcher or tamer, but rather a collector as you record your way through New World. Needless to say, go ahead and check out all these games as they have many other twists and exciting game mechanics of their own that I didn't mention today. So what am I planning to do for my project? My project has all these creatures based off of science topics. So I was initially thinking how I could make recruiting the creatures be on theme. The first thought were flashcards. So basically using a card to summon your mom. I'm also thinking of calling the creatures of my project just stemmas. Eh, that can change though. But here's the thing. I didn't want to trap the stemma inside the card but rather have them just be called to your location, a calling card per se. In fact, I'm teetering between keeping these as cards or making them part of your in-world phone, just calling in your stemmas. But do they run across the lands just to find you? Not really, cause the card would make a portal. Through goop technology, wherever your stemma is chilling, they could decide to go into the goop and come out the other end for you. Who knows, maybe they might reject you if they're too overleveled. That depends on how much time I have to code and make the game. Okay, but what is this portal goop? That doesn't sound very scientific. And yes, it's true that I have to use a bit of sci-fi in my world building. For now, this goop is how I am representing imaginary displacement. Where imaginary means relating to the square root of negative one. What? That's right. 
Let's start with what square root means. It means that the outcome multiplied by itself would be the number inside the root. So basically square root of 25 is 5, as 5 times 5 is 25. And the square root of 1 is, well, 1. But every outcome of a square root could honestly be either positive or negative because multiplying the negative number by itself cancels out the negative, yielding a positive number. All right, then what's the square root of a negative number? Like negative one. It, it doesn't exist. At least it doesn't exist in our real world. So mathematicians just call the square root of negative one I, standing for imaginary number. Square root of negative 25 would be 5 times i. Now this imaginary number deal might not fit into the real number line, but they can be depicted of having an axis of their own. This plane between the real and imaginary axis is called the complex plane, which is often used by engineers and physicists to represent concepts like circuitry. Hello! Now say that this real axis represents real time, the time we are experiencing, like this YouTube video, while negative time is like rewinding to 10 seconds ago. Alright, what is the imaginary axis then? Stephen Hawking talked about the concept of imaginary time. What if time wasn't just on the real axis as we perceive it, but also a separate imaginary axis that goes through different timelines? While he said we can't test if our universe had done this in the past or not, he mentioned how science fiction writers also didn't touch the subject because they didn't fully get it. Frankly, I'm not sure if I'm using it correctly either, but the imaginary technology in my world would be responsible for basically mini wormholes to get from one place to another as it cross into a different timeline to where the whole world is shifted in a certain direction but nothing else really changed. Now the stemma that this goop is collected from is Comptid, by Complex Cryptid. They're based off the Headless Horseman, but just the horse part, and they resemble a lowercase i. I can talk more about what I have planned with Comptid, but I'd rather show that than tell. In the next month, I'll really hunker down and try to learn Godot or continue on Unity. I mean, the project has been on Unity thus far, but whew, the recent events made me lose quite a lot of trust in them. But yeah, even I didn't know how much this genre was tied to friendship and mutual understanding until I researched about the Monster Tamer's origins. And it's not necessarily about being kid friendly. It just started with talking to your opponents. I really hope I get to make something people can experience one day. To not only befriend, but also understand these creatures that represent the very concepts we see in our own real world. Anyways, thank you so much for watching till the end, and especially thank you to my Patreon subscribers. I'll be posting more game updates over there in the next month as I explore Godot and pine over the previous Unity project. But if you liked the video, you can share and subscribe for free, as I have a whole series here going over my stemmas. Alright, thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.